um, get to talk about what some encounters with Jesus look like. Um, and yeah, to be able to do that together is really special. And we have big Wednesdays during the summer because we also have Wednesday morning prayer. So if you want to be at the manse twice in one day, this is the ticket. Um, it's a really lovely time to get to know what's going on in each other's lives, um, pray for things that are happening for us and for the world, um, for our community. Um, so we'd really invite you to that. And there's also a Zoom link that goes out in our weekly email if you'd be interested in joining online. Um, and you're not signed up to that email, please come speak to me or anybody else you see up the front this morning. That'd be great. We'd love to have you. And uh, I've been asked by one of the parents this morning to do a little um, disclaimer. We have a fancy fancy new car drainer going on because if you're like me, you do not carry cash. So this is a really easy way um, to give a cornerstone. We um, are a community that believe that everything that we've been given is from God. And one of the ways that we worship um, and follow Jesus is to give part of our money um, to our church or to local organizations that are part of sharing his um, love and his um, work in the world. So um, I heard that a very enthusiastic volunteer was asking people on the way in whether they would like to contribute to the card reader. Um, and uh, we love to see the enthusiasm, um, but please don't feel under any obligation to give, especially if you're visiting. Um, that's not something that we like to do under duress whatsoever. Um, so yeah, it's there for you to use if that is a helpful thing for you. Um, but it's, it's very fun and funky, so everyone's got a bit excited. Um, and... Yeah, I, I'm just going to pray for our kids and our young people now as they head out to Kids Church. Um, and if you have young people um, that are going to go out for the service, if you just head over to the left here and there'll be some leaders to direct you. I'm not sure whether this is actually all true. So, um, yeah, if you head over and the... Well, it was true at some point, but it might have changed in the summer. Um, so if you head over, there'll be some lovely people um, with some name tags on who'll be able to direct you to the correct place to be. Um, but yeah, let's pray for our children. Jesus, thank you for the blessing of calling your people to be and make disciples. Father, for the children and young people in our church family, we thank you so much for them and pray that they will come to know you as their saviour. Please open their hearts today, Lord, to your grace and goodness and reveal to them your love in practical ways through their family in you. Amen. Um, so as the kids head out, I am just going to ask Tim to come up and lead us all in prayer this morning. If you'd like to have a little time to say hello to your neighbour and just uh, welcome your neighbour, that would be great.
let's pray together. Let's start our prayers by praising God together, the Lord of the universe and our Heavenly Father. I'll use the words of Psalm 34, but I'll try and say each line slowly, and in the pause between, perhaps you can make those words your own. I will praise the Lord at all times. His praise will be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Come, let us tell of God's greatness. Let's exalt his name together. The Lord will redeem those who serve him, and no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Thank you and praise you, God. Amen. Let's spend some time in prayers of confession now. Each and every one of us is touched by the brokenness of the world, and when we realize the ways that we've contributed, we recognize our need for forgiveness. As we all reflect on this week, what ways do you want to ask God for forgiveness? Let's say a prayer of confession. Almighty God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed. We've not loved you with all of our heart, mind, soul and strength. We've not loved our neighbour as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrong we've done and the good that we've left undone. Lord, you are full of compassion and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. There is always forgiveness with you. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds. Strengthen our wills and rest our souls. Speak to each of us, God, and let your word abide in us, bringing about your holy, wise, and good will in our lives and communities. Amen. And finally, our special topic of prayer this week is for students. So let's pray for our students, the students in this town, and the students who are part of our church community and those who serve them. Lord God, with the industrial dispute going on in universities, we pray for all the students who may be feeling anxious. We pray especially now for those who are involved in decision making. We ask that you will give them wisdom and that despite disagreements there will be good relating and that these issues will be resolved soon. Lord, we thank you for all the students who volunteered to be uh, student group leaders this week during the course of the year. Um, also, we thank you for Shadi and Anna and Natasha who serve in that way. Lord, we pray this will have been a blessing to them and we just praise you for the ways in which your Holy Spirit's been in work through the times of fellowship in your word and time in your word in student groups. Our Lord, also we want to thank you for the recent NAVS weekend away and the testimony of the speaker, Lawrence Koo that, Lord God, your love is priceless treasure beyond worth of all other things. And may you continue the work you've started in the hearts and minds of those who listened to that message this last weekend. And Heavenly Father, we especially want to think of those students who are coming to the end of their time here. As they explore the next thing they're going to do, we ask that you will give them assurance that you are a trustworthy God and peace that you will go with them in all things. Lord, we also want to lift up those students that don't yet have a relationship with you coming to St. Andrews from all around the world. 
if there's some who particularly on our hearts, we name them before you now. And we pray that you would continue to draw them to you, Lord Jesus, through your amazing gospel of grace. And finally, Lord, we want to pray for those who work with our students, especially Matthew and Gunnar, Colin and Louise, Xander and Jared. We pray that you would strengthen them inwardly by your Holy Spirit. Give them the love they need as they come alongside students in your name. And we ask that you provide for them in all they need and bless them. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come to read God's word, let's pray together. Our living, unshakable Jesus, we worship you. We thank you for your holy word. And Holy Spirit, on this Pentecost Sunday, we, we just thank you so much for the light and understanding that you shine on its pages. Shine on its pages now as we read it together. We ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our readings are from Genesis and from the Psalms and from Matthew. So let's start in Genesis chapter 12. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your country, your relatives and your father's home and go to a land that I am going to show you. I will give you many descendants and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous. So that, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse those who curse you. And through you, through you, I will bless all the nations. Someone happy are those who reject the advice of evil people, who do not follow the example of sinners or join with those who have no use for God. Instead, they find joy in obeying the law of the Lord, and they study it day and night. They're like trees, trees that grow beside a stream that bear fruit at the right time, and whose leaves do not dry up. They succeed in everything they do, but evil people, are not like this at all. They are like straw that the wind blows away. Sinners will be condemned by God and kept apart from God's own people. The righteous are guided and protected by the Lord, but the evil, the evil are on their way to their doom. Matthew 5, happy are those who know they're spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble. They will receive what God has promised. Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them fully. Happy are those who are merciful to others. God will be merciful to them. Happy are those who are pure in heart. They will see God. Happy are those who work for peace. God will call them his children. Happy are those who are persecuted because they do what God requires. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. This is the word of the Lord. Hi there, good morning. I feel like there's a lot of new faces or faces that I haven't seen before. So, hello, welcome. Uh, my name's Jeff. Uh, before I sort of get into this, I just wanted to let everybody know that uh, at some point I'm gonna mention a little bit of a story about uh, a time that my mom had a miscarriage. And I just wanted to sort of flag that up if that's something that is a little bit of like a raw issue for you. I didn't want it to just surprise you in the middle of the sermon. So if there's something you need, if you wanna like sip out or something like that, it's totally understandable. 
Uh, so we are talking about the Beatitudes again this week. It's uh, two weeks in a row that we spent on this. Uh, and that's because the, the Sermon on the Mount, I think, is, could be quite an odd thing to explore, especially if you are a Christian and you've been in the church a little bit. Uh, for some time, but also I think it's odd for just our our modern sort of brains, the way that we think about the world, the way that we think about our lives, the way that we think about morality. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing, and the Beatitudes that we're looking at today, they force us to ask big questions about the values of our life, the types of people that we are, the, the ways that we sort of are, are in, in the world, our mode of being. Uh, most of us, I think, probably don't spend a lot of time routinely thinking about these big questions in this way. And I also think that we're not really used to sermons that ask us, or even bits of scripture that ask us to, to do this. I think normally what we want is some sort of practical takeaway that we can implement into our life today. And the Sermon on the Mount just doesn't quite fit that mold, that expectation. Uh, so one way I thought we, we could look at this is, is just to show how theologically and morally it's, it's difficult to, to read the Sermon on the Mount with a, a certain way of thinking about uh, what our expectations are from the Bible. So this is one of my favorite worship songs. Uh, I think it's Chris Tomlin who, who wrote the song. It's, I mean, it's the gospel presentation. It's beautiful. I'm forgiven because he's singing to Jesus, you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. It's a, it's, I think it's a beautiful way of encapsulating the, the cost of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and the grace that we experience because of it. But sometimes I think we can take this image and we can force out some of the wisdom that the Bible has to offer. Uh, if we, we think like, I, I know that the gospel is that because I'm a sinner, uh, I can't earn my salvation, and yet God forgives me and welcomes me into a relationship. We sort of sometimes end it there. And we have big questions about our life. How do I live? How do I make decisions? What does God, what God want for me that I think we sometimes have trouble forcing into this, this conception? So if we're just thinking, you know, uh, after we become a Christian or we're, uh, we experience this grace, okay, I, I know that I'm called to be a good person, but I need to remember that legalism is bad and I need to be careful about trying to earn my salvation through good, good works, that can sort of put a distance between us and some of the profound wisdom that I think the Bible has to offer because we rightly don't want to think that if I do this and I can sort of make myself better, then that must mean that I don't need God. So I think in, in this framework, some of the ways that people sometimes interpret the Sermon on the Mount and including these Beatitudes is the idea that the whole sermon is there to show us our radical need for God. Right? So sometimes, I've heard this before, it, when we get to Matthew 5.48, uh, Jesus at one point says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And sometimes we interpret that as thinking, well, this is a call to something that is beyond my ability, therefore showing my need for God. And I don't actually fully disagree with this. I think that a part of the Sermon on the Mount does show us a, an ideal person in Jesus, something that we can't attain on our own, something that we desperately need God's help for. But if that's the only way that we approach the wisdom in this sermon, then I think we're sort of missing the point. It's the, the Sermon on the Mount comes from a genre of biblical literature called wisdom literature, and it's all throughout the, the New Testament, and it's all throughout the Old Testament, and it tells us how to live. It points to what's good about our life. The point of wisdom literature is to orient us towards hope and truth and love and beauty and really just how to be a human right now in this broken world. And if we miss that, I think that we can do some harm. So when I was uh, about eight or nine years old, uh, my, my mom was pregnant with uh, a little boy and it was very late in the term of her pregnancy when she miscarried. And at about this time, my family had begun attending a church uh, somewhat, kind of sporadically. My parents were exploring Christianity, exploring the church. And when my mom had this miscarriage, it was devastating for the whole family. I mean, I remember realizing that I, I thought I was going to have a little brother, and I wasn't going to have a little brother. I've never seen my mom more distraught than during this period of her life. Even, I mean, she's gone through you know, difficult things since then. 
And the church that we were a part of was, they were very nice and they, you know, I remember them bringing us meals and things like that. But I also remember, but they didn't really have a way to talk about what she was going through, how to live in a fallen world, how to navigate tragedy and pain and suffering and calamity and what God was calling her to even in the midst of this, this tragedy. Wisdom literature, I think, is a means of grace. Wisdom literature in the, in the Old Testament, like Psalm 1 that we read, and in the New Testament, like the Sermon on the Mount, they're all about how to navigate, how to respond to the brokenness of this world. So without wisdom literature, I think that we end up with some somewhat uh, hurtful platitudes, things like, well, everything happens for a reason, right? Just wait. Trust that God has a plan and it'll all work out. Why is it so hurtful to hear those things when we're experiencing pain, when we're experiencing tragedy? I think for one, it can often feel like an indictment, right? Like you're just sad because you're, you're lacking faith. But it also sounds a little futile, right? It sounds like there's nothing that we can do. That as humans, we're, we're, we're supposed to just you know, sit there and, and, and wait for everything to work out. But I think that as humans, we're made in the image of the living God and we're made to be active, to have agency, and not just to be passive. So wisdom literature, like what we're exploring today, meets us right there, wherever we are in life, whether we're at the highest of highs or the lowest of lows. And it challenges us to act, to have agency, in ways that honor God and allow us to more deeply experience the graciousness of his love and the good news of the gospel. So why? Why does this happen? Why do we sort of distance ourselves from, from the wisdom of, of the Bible sometimes? And I think that be, some of it is because we're lost in, some of the wisdom is lost in translation. Uh, I thought that this was going to be a home run reference, and then I talked to a Gen Zer this week, and they said, I've never seen Little Mermaid. <laughs> Thus, putting more distance between me and the Gen Zs as if I, I didn't already know that. So this is a Disney film called The Little Mermaid. And people my age, we didn't have streaming, we didn't have Apple Plus, we had these big chunky VHSs that we would watch over and over and over again. Whether we liked the movie or not, I didn't think that I was a, a fan of The Little Mermaid, but I've seen it a billion times, because that's all we had. But one scene in The Little Mermaid that I often think about, especially when I'm thinking about how people in a different era with different languages thought about the world is this scene where Ariel, the little mermaid, she's obsessed with humans and she's always collecting little artifacts from the, the human world. And she brings it to this, this bird and he thinks he's like, pretends like he's an expert in all these things. So like in this instance, she shows him this, uh, I forget what she calls him, like a dinghy bobber or something. It's a fork. And he says, oh, well, this is to comb your hair with. This is a brush to comb your hair, right? What it demonstrates is the separation of the, the culture of, the, of the, the animal world and the underground world and the human world and the separation where you can see what they're using, see what they're maybe talking about, but you're, there's a disconnect there. <clears throat> what we're not used to when we're reading the, the, the wisdom literature of the Bible, I think, is, comes from the separations from our linguistic and our cultural norms, the things that we sort of take for granted with how we understand things and, and make sense of things. So confusing translations, having this distance where we don't really know what to do with the thingy bobbers, uh, puts this di distance between us and, and the Beatitudes. I think it makes it even easier to say, well, this must just be an example of, of how we're just failing to live up to God's standard. But we don't, we're not lost in that translation. We, there's a lot of excellent work that we can research and, and get closer to it and allows us to meditate more deeply on, on the wisdom and the truth that's, that's given to us in, the, in these passages. So a great way to start is just thinking about the word blessed. It's a word that I think many of us use often and with sort of a, a vague sense of, of what it actually means. Of course, I'm not saying that we're all using the word wrong or anything like that, but oftentimes there's a little vagueness about like, okay, what does it actually mean to be blessed or to bless someone or something like that? And actually in the Old Testament, uh, the, English, the, the word that's translated into to blessed is often one of two different words, and they have 
quite different meanings. So the first one is Barak, and that's the, the word that's in, that uh, we read from Genesis 12 today. And that has to do with usually some sort of bestowing good things on someone else. It often has to do with honor or praise, or sometimes it's even the verb of, of kneeling in front of someone. But then in other places in the Old Testament, the word asher is often translated into to blessed. And that has to do with being happy, or as we'll talk about a little bit more, being full of contentment or feeling goodness in your soul. Uh, some people talk, use the word flourishing. But they're different words, and yet, because of we don't have words that map onto them perfectly in the English language, we usually use the word blessed. But then if we go along in history a little bit, uh, people started to translate the Old Testament into Greek, and of course the Old Testament was mostly written in Greek, and there happens to be two uh, Greek words that map on pretty well to Barak and Asher. So uh, eulogia is the, the word that's mostly close to Barak, and as you can see in Galatians, it's, it's used in a very similar way. It actually harkens back to that same verse in Genesis 12, where there's a type of blessing that has to do with this honor and praise and bestowing good things onto someone else. Whereas uh, makarios is the other Greek word that's often used in the New Testament, but it has to do with, again, this sort of idea of being happy and experiencing sort of deep, abiding joy in, in your heart. But if we keep going in history, we still, we're, we're still not even close to the English translations yet. Uh, we get to Latin. Again, we have two separate words that sort of help separate these two different uh, concepts that, again, wouldn't really be stuck together until we started translating them into English. Uh, but benedictum, again, used, it's the same word that's used in Genesis 12 and Galatians 3 and in all different places when it has to do with blessings that are the sort of bestowment or, or honor and praise, whereas uh, beatitudo has to do with happiness and flourishing. This is why this passage of Matthew 5 is called the Beatitudes. It would, in English, if we translate it, it would probably be called the happies, which I think would give it a little bit of a different ring. But unfortunately, and I don't think this is a terrible thing, but unfortunately, all of this, all these, these different meanings sort of get squished together into the word blessed. But I think what makes this even more confounding is even when we use the words blessed and happy in our own sort of modern way of talking, we don't really have a great way of, of getting a handle on them. Uh, I love stock photography, so this is all the stock photography that comes up when you search uh, blessed. And, I think it maps onto how we generally talk about blessed. When we say, I'm feeling blessed, or I'm so blessed, we tend to talk about the good things that God has given us in our life that we're, we're thankful for. I think oftentimes when we use the word blessed, it's sort of a shorthand for God is being good to me, and I'm thankful for that. But that isn't really what happiness is, right? It's, not, it's certainly not what makarios means here in the Beatitudes. But even when we talk about happy, when we say someone is a, is a happy person, has lived a happy life, uh, we're usually talking about some sort of emotional elation, right? Uh, I mean, these are all, this is what happiness looks like if you Google it. And of course, there's just the most annoying song of all time, if anybody remembers that. If you go to someone's eulogy, eul uh, eulogia, interesting, eulogy, you don't normally hear t people say, oh, they lived a happy life. And if they did, they would probably mean they were always up here, just smiling and happy, dancing around with a big funny hat or something like that. So even the way that we use happiness sort of separates us from, from what's, what's going on here in, in, in the Beatitudes. We mean different things by blessed and happiness. So uh, I thought it would be interesting to look at how a non-English, well, somewhat non-English translation in a modern time deals with this difference. And uh, I went to the, the Hawaiian Pigeon Bible. Uh, it's a, a translation that is made by uh, Hawaiians in Hawaii. So the pigeon language is uh, a simplified version of English that's used in, in Hawaii among native speakers. Uh, so this is people who speak Polynesian dialects, but also will, will speak uh, pidgin English so that they can communicate with, with other people from different Polynesian tribes, but also sort of in, uh, in English-speaking Hawaii. Um, so uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it this way, because if I did, I think it would sound disrespectful. I don't think I could do this without putting on like an accent, and that we don't want that. So I'm going to try to say this 
uh, sort of it, uh, in a way that just has like normal English, right? So uh, the first one, when we're talking about, well, what does it mean to be blessed? They say, uh, can stay good inside, which I love. It's navigating through life when you have the highs and the lows. It's not about being happy and experiencing that, that elation. It's a confidence that you're remaining good inside, that you're, you're settled, that you're at peace. It's more of an abiding joy. So it says the people that know they need God inside their heart, they can stay good inside because God in the sky is their king. The people that cry inside their heart, they stay good inside because God is going to comfort them. Uh, the people that, that don't need to put themselves uh, first every time, they can stay good inside because God is going to give them the whole world. The people that like to do the right thing every time, they can stay good inside because God is going to help them do it. So as we can see, it's not just about getting God's favor. It's not just about receiving these blessings. It's about experiencing this deep goodness inside of us because we're living according to God's wisdom, even when we're brought low. So it's timeless, universal wisdom that meets us no matter where we are. If we speak Greek or Latin or English or Hawaiian pidgin, there's, some, there's wisdom and truth that meets us in our life where we are. But one more difficulty I think we have to overcome when we think about this wisdom literature is the different ways that we think about what's good and bad, or what morality is. Uh, it's not just about the words themselves and how we translate it. It's about translating our whole way of thinking about what we expect from, from morality. The idea of wisdom, I think, is difficult to hear because we don't think about living our life that way. We think about actions being moral as whether they're right or wrong, I think, often. We ask, is this a good thing to do or is it a bad thing to do? Is doing X a sin? And if it's not, then I'm fine and no one can judge me. But biblical wisdom literature, like the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, frustratingly doesn't work this way. We don't get a checklist that if we can just read it down, if we could just read down the, the, the checklist and say, all right, I did all these things, then I know I'm good. Instead, it assumes a, a common human purpose. And of course, we modern people don't really like to think that way. We, don't, we think that each one of us have our own special, unique purpose that we decide on our own. No one can tell me how to live my life, right? I want to live my life my way. And I think that's where this idea that if it's not a sin, then everyone should just leave me alone comes in because we think that we're the captain navigating our own sense of purpose. But wisdom literature says, no, you are created for a certain way of being. And if you're not living this way, you're not going to experience this deep abiding goodness in your life. And because of this, wisdom literature says, there's wiser people than you that have something to share in your life. And it's usually oriented around some sort of moral exemplar or some sort of ideal or some, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a concept, maybe it's a fictional person that people look up to and say, that's the kind of life I want to live. And you orient yourself in the same ways that that person orients their lives. In ancient times, this was normally like great warriors and things like that. But again, rather than focusing on individual actions and, and saying, is this right or is this wrong? It's about cultivating a way of being in the world. These are broad ways of living and it doesn't give us this exact rubric that we just follow. So what did the Beatitudes actually say? these happies, the flourishings, the staying good insides. I think that they should, they ought to provoke us to meditate deeply on these ways of being. We can't just go through and say, am I spiritually poor? Yes, got it. Do I mourn? Yes, got it. But what is it calling us to? What kind of way of existing in the world do these call us to? Rather than thinking, Am I doing the right thing? Did I repent from the sins that I, that I messed up? Have I confessed? Which are really important practices for, for Christians. We need to reflect on how much we truly live into these things that God calls us to. Do we make decisions about our life according to these values? Or do we make decisions based on the idea, no, 
I got this, I can figure it out. There's a rational way to get through this. If I work hard enough, I can fix the things in my life. The very first beatitude confronts us with that. Of course, when we're knocked on our butts by life, we usually get this pretty clearly. We automatically feel spiritually needy because in those moments we realize, I don't got this, which is what makes, I think, this promise so beautiful. He says, yours is the kingdom. You'll never let God into your life more easily than when you let go of all of these other things, when you let go of the control that you try to have over your life. This is when we recognize him the most, when we recognize our need for his grace the most. And it, I'm tempted to keep going one by one through these, but another thing to say about wisdom literature is rarely when you get a set of all of these different values are you meant to think about them one by one. They're all supposed to go together. Uh, usually people talk about how they, they form a sort of web and you can't have one without the other, without another, without another. And you, it, it, it's rational if you think about it, like you can't be poor in spirit and, and be, have that, that deep abiding joy in your heart if you also aren't merciful to other people. Would we say like they're a good person because they're poor in spirit, but they're also sometimes a jerk to other people? It doesn't work that way. But this is also why we think about the moral exemplar so much, the ideal of being moral. Last week when Jared was talking about this, he pointed out that the ideal of this is Jesus himself. So the Beatitudes as a whole show us the character of who Jesus is. And the purpose of the Beatitudes, the purpose of the whole Sermon on the Mount is, is for us to emulate him in our own lives. And wisdom literature itself as a genre predates the life of Jesus by hundreds, thousands of years. And we, we read Psalm 1. But this is where the wisdom of the Sermon on the Mount is so unique. Because here we have wisdom incarnate. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians that, that Jesus himself is wisdom. And he's talking about it in terms of the redemption on the cross as well. So the logic here is that wisdom tells us how to be happy, how to be a flourishing person, in a complicated, messy, broken world based on the reality that wisdom himself, Jesus, the perfect human who was the happiest and flourished the most, can give to us. So, of course, we couldn't separate the individual qualities of Jesus and say, first I'm going to work on this, and then I'm going to work on this, and then I'm going to work on this. They all come together, just like the Beatitudes here. But they are listed, and they do communicate truths that we have to sort of think about one by one. So the way that some people do this, and some theologians will, will try to group them together and say, well, these have to do with this thing, and these have to do with, with another thing, and maybe we can think about them in these different ways. So one of the ways that I like to think about grouping them together, and I don't think this is the only way, but uh, finding the... I think it's pretty insightful to think about these first four in terms of the, the inner parts of our life. Thinking about our relationship to God in the innermost parts of our life, the contemplative parts of our life. Well, as the last four are mostly calls to action out into the world. And as I've been thinking about these first lists all together, I've been thinking about how they interestingly map on negatively to a very popular TV show that's been, that's been on. And if you haven't seen the show, that's fine. I think I can explain it very, very easily. If you haven't seen the show, good for you. You're probably free from that, that gross feeling when I, I, I watch the show. Uh, but in the show, so the, the main person is the, the older gentleman from Dundee, Brian Cox. Uh, he's, uh, he's the actor, but he plays Logan Roy, who's uh, the model of a successful business titan. He's a multi-billionaire, uh, and he, he's built this uh, media empire through being sort of ruthless, but more importantly, we're told and we're actually shown throughout the series that he has this vitality, this sort of force that just, he's impervious to anyone. It seems like anyone who comes up against him, he will run over and he will make his way happen. So in this sense, he's the opposite of spiritually poor. He's very confident. He doesn't get dragged down by anything and he gets things done no matter what. Now, the whole point of the show is that he has uh, he has four, four children, but three of them really are in line to succeed him as the CEO once he retires or, or dies. And each of them struggles with something that keeps them from being that big, magnanimous person that can take over and push this company into the future. 
And uh, Kendall, the guy on, on the, the second to the, to the left, he, his struggle is with being meek. He constantly wonders if he's good enough. And throughout the series, he's humbled by different events in his life. And uh, when he is humbled, he gets knocked down in the eyes of his, his dad, and it keeps him from being able to institute the plans that he has to make, make this company great. Uh, Siobhan is, is the girl on, on the right. She's uh, the only sister, and her whole deal is that she tries to be a righteous person. She's consumed by wanting to know that, uh, that she's a good person. People refer to her as a social justice warrior, but she also wants to take over the company. So she has this tension of wanting to be successful and succeed at all costs, but also wants to know that she's a good person. And that tends to be her downfall, and it prevents her from climbing the corporate ladder. Interestingly, uh, Roman there on the far left, he's literally brought down by his grief, by his mourning. He's experienced trauma throughout his life, and he has these strained relationships with people in his life, like his mom and his dad. And when he, he's a really weird character. And it, oftentimes what bubbles to the surface is this deep abiding mourning, and that keeps him from being a normal person, but also just being able to obviously succeed. Now, I don't think this illustration, of course, applies directly to any of us. To my knowledge, no one here is in the runnings to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Maybe Haley. <laughs> but I think it, it sort of shows an extremity of this. Because I do think that we, we, we assume that to succeed in our culture, we have to have confidence. We have to be opportunistic and jump on the, the opportunities when they arise. You can't be a sucker, right? You have to have a stiff upper lip. You can't be mourning. And that's how you get ahead. More importantly, that's how you navigate life through difficult times. But not, this is not true, says Jesus. The kingdom of heaven belongs to those who feel spiritually broken. They recognize their lack. They recognize their need. And for that reason, they can stay good inside even through the difficult times. He says, he tells us to mourn. Be real about the real grief that we have that is a part of living in a broken world. Bring that to God. Bring that mourning to God because he will comfort you. And your happiness in this broken world is only possible when you've been comforted. And he says, don't put on a show like you're the best and the strongest. You can let go of all of that bravado. Embrace meekness. Embrace humility so you can have your heart open to receive the abundance of God's graces. And he says, strive for the righteous life, even though you know you're a sinner, especially because you know you're a sinner, because it's what God calls you to. And it's impossible to be fully human and flourish unless you have a desire to live an upright life. And by God's grace, he will satisfy that hunger for righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit as he works on your heart throughout your life. So these things all point to this inner part of our life, this inner contemplation of, of who we are in front of God and how we see ourselves and how we accept the things that happen to us in life. But again, it, I don't think it's a call to passivity because as we go forward, these, as, as the other ones maybe provoke the inadequacies that we have before God and being human in a fallen world, these empower us even when we've been brought low. It's very much the opposite of resting in the knowledge that just everything happens for a reason. But they also, I think, run contrary to what we want out of life for ourselves, especially when we've been brought low. And it's also what I think culture tells us to do. I mean, I think we live in a time where self-care is, is sort of uh, lifted up quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have anything against self-care. I think taking care of your body is important. Rest is very important. Breaks are important. I don't know how often I'm hangry and I just need to have a little snack and then I feel better. These are important things, but they're not ends in themselves. These four Beatitudes push us outward into the world with action and agency for the promise of that deep abiding joy. It's a call to be merciful to others, to have a pure heart, which is a call to have integrity right down to the core of our being and, and the motivations for all of our actions. It's a call to be peacemakers, to be actively trying to build shalom in the world. But there's also a reminder that we will be persecuted for a lot of this when we act differently to the world. It's a reminder that these actions 
aren't taken well by everyone. And there, there is a real possibility for persecution. So on the individual level, I think there's a lot of purpose that could be found in, in, in these calls to action, especially in the midst of tragedy. They're sobering words. Jesus tells us that happiness is possible, though, in the midst of all of this brokenness, and our own agency is involved. It's a point to the reality that we're in the midst of a struggle between good and evil, between peace and destruction. And again, he promises persecution. And it's, uh, it's real to the reality that we're going to be brought low sometimes. But it's also a call to things like purity and the deepest depths of our core, which means, again, rooting out the impure motivations that we have for some of our actions, which is how we, we come closer to God and allows us to see him better even when tragedies make him seem distant. He says if we take the path of humility, that we should still be called peacemakers to do good in the world. You don't have to raise your, your, your station in life to be a great person in order to do good, in order to bring peace. We could be peacemakers in every context that we find ourselves in. It says that even when we're in the midst of suffering, when we feel broken, we should mourn, but we should also be trying to build peace and to be merciful to other people. So if that's at the individual level, I think in the community, this is what the church should look like, and I think it is what the church does look like when we're at our best. People are broken by the world, and they're brought low, and they cry out to God, and then their brothers and their sisters comfort them by showing them mercy, by being loving, by being actively trying to build shalom in the community. I think God uses the mercy of others to bring comfort to people who are in pain. But it's also missional. Because it's not just about caring for other Christians, it's about caring for everyone and demonstrating the light of the gospel in the midst of a fallen world. And by building peace in our communities, and maybe in our extended families and our workplaces with people who aren't Christians, then we can show who Jesus is to a dark and broken world. So what do we do with all of this? What do we do with all of this wisdom? How do we, we take it home? Because again, I think most of us, when we come to to, the, to scripture, when we come to a sermon, we're hoping for practical takeaways that we can take home and immediately implement into our life. But again, I think that's asking the wrong questions from this passage. To listen to the Sermon on the Mount, we have to believe, I think, that the wisdom of the Creator can and will teach us something true about the purpose of our lives and that we can't create on our own. So rather than trying to drill the text for practical and concrete actions for what we can do, the Beatitudes, and I think the whole sermon as we make our way through this summer, should provoke us to ask big questions about our life. Who am I imitating? What kind of life do I think will make me happy? Do I really believe that there's a courageous life that's about pureness and gentleness, the life of Jesus that will make me happy? Or do I sort of have a, a Logan Roy sort of conception that I try to imitate that I think will make me happy? If I just work a little bit harder, if I could be a little tougher, that's what the secret is. I think another big question is to ask, do we really believe that Jesus' life was the happiest life? Is that the life that we want? We often don't think about Jesus, I think, in that way. But if we're really going to take these words seriously, we need to take a long vision, a long view of our own life and the values that we have. Do I make decisions about orienting my life around being a peacemaker? Do I make the big life decisions around the idea that meekness is a virtue? Do I make big life decisions around wanting to be merciful to others? Or am I trying to make my life better more comfortable, larger? Do I mourn when I experience tragedy, when others do? Do I let that brokenness really affect my soul? It's like looking in the mirror and asking, am I a merciful person? These are awkward questions to ask, but they're important. And I think they're immensely hopeful. I think this message of the Beatitudes is a message of hope that Jesus tells us and shows us how to live and how to experience this abiding goodness because he demonstrated it with his own life. He suffered, he was poor, he was meek, he was knocked down and despised, he experienced grief, he mourned, he was persecuted. In the midst of all of that, he's a peacemaker. He's pure in heart and he shows incredible mercy. 
And it all culminates on the cross. He tells us and he shows us how to be truly happy in this life now. So let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for that part of our relationship where you come by our side and you tenderly tell us the parts of our lives that, that need to be oriented, better oriented to you, God. I pray that as we, we consider the words of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount this summer, God, that we would be open to them. We would come to them with a spiritual poverty, recognizing the need that we have to hear from you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. So let's stand and respond, acknowledging God as good, the source of all wisdom, and let's marvel at who he is and how he acts. yet unseen who can reach the height of understanding to play the notes of wisdom's melody who has weighed the dust of every mountain who has walked the mysteries of the deep and who has laid the earth on its foundation and who conducts the waves upon the sea I stand in awe of you I stand in awe You have seen, you have seen, and from the beginning, and you have been before the world began, and you have reached to me within my darkness, and in the light of mercy. Who can know the mind of our Creator? Who can know the mind of our Creator? And who can speak of wonders yet unseen? And who can reach the height of understanding to lay the notes of wisdom's mellow? I stand in all. I stand in all.
So Father, would you help us to look to you and trust you, to see your life not as restrictive or a sacrifice not worth making, but to see it as one connected with the true life source. And we pray that with our broken hearts and with our sinful tendencies, Lord, that you would be at work in us, renewing a right spirit within us, making us new in your life and by your spirit. We bring the things that hurt to you and we ask for your mercy, your, your help, and that you would cultivate in us a love for your wisdom and your good. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As the dead lands for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart, desire. my friend. would you take that desire of our hearts and would you cause that to be true by the work of your spirit and your resurrection power in our lives in our community we pray in Jesus name amen so we'll sing one more song together come thou fount of every blessing teach our hearts to sing thy grace um, but as we do let's collect our children and bring them back to join us before we're sent out with our benediction Come.
thou found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by to wonder. So just as we close today, um, I thought it would be really special for us all to be able to share in the Lord's Prayer together as we're thinking about God's wisdom and what it looks for us to be transformed by him, um, for our hearts to be longing for him above all things. Um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to join together with the church all over the world, past, present and future, um, and sharing how Jesus taught us to pray um, and lifting all those things to him, asking for his kingdom, um, asking for his forgiveness and his, his peace, knowing that we are assured of it. Um, so I just ask you to join with me as we all say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So now just to send us out into our week, um, if we can join with me in the phrases in bold for our benediction. May the grace of God, deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ, stronger than our need, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, richer than our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining with us today. Um, we would love to get to know you um, better, for us to get to know each other. So please, if you can, stay around. Grab some more tea or coffee back downstairs. Um, and we're, yeah, we're really grateful for you all with us this morning. Thank you.